Um, so next up we have Dr. Catherine Roberts Parker, who is a unique interdis interdisciplinary researcher with a professional practice in historical folk music. Can we share so that I can also switch to your um, She is currently the Marie Sadosku Curry okay. Fellow at Newcastle University in the UK, researching the performance history of Morris dancing music. That's a good connection there with the last presentation. And musicians around the British Isles. The research has followed on from a PhD at the University of Sydney, where she researched the musical culture of traditional festivals in the British Isles and their representation in Shakespeare's theatre. Catherine is a musician and theatre practitioner with experience composing and performing live music with Matriarch Theatre. She is also the producer of The Bard Band, a historical folk music ensemble in Sydney and Talon, an experimental Morris group in the UK. So um, as soon as we get this slide sorted, we'll be hearing all about yeah, that's fine. That's but everyone was there, you can only see the actual like the presentation. Yeah. yeah, okay. So they so can just or do you wanna or do you wanna share everything? So anything yeah, on your screen. Everything, everything will be better. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, everyone. No, no, that's Yeah, share the whole thing then. And then yeah. And you can just go to the browser if you need to. Yeah. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Thanks. Sorry, thanks Toby, and sorry for talking through your introduction. No, that's right. there. Um, so yeah, I also want to acknowledge that um, this presentation is taking place on unceded Gadigal land, and that also I've recently moved back from the UK to Gadigal and Bidjigal land on the east coast of Sydney, which is where most of my music making takes place. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Oops. So today I'm going to share a bit about some folk artists that I've met and who I've been collaborating with during my fellowship in the UK. So just as a background, um, Newcastle University, where I have been working, um, is the only place in England, as opposed to Ireland and elsewhere, um, where you can do a Bachelor of Music in Folk Performance. Um, so they have some great folk practitioners working there. And so I've been um, focused partly on connecting with that community of practice alongside my research. And today I'm going to share about some people who uh, sort of big up and coming influences in what I'm terming a new wave folk movement. And you can see from this lovely picture of Sam Lee here um, what part of this movement is about. He says, All the songs I sing are about relationships to the land. They're expressions of a time where we as people were as in tune with the natural world as any owl, fox, or badger. So you can see from Sam's words here that the new wave folk movement does retain some of that nostalgia that characterised the folk revival movements of the early 20th century and the post-war folk revival movement. But they have let go of um, some of the notions of the early folk revivals as Michael Brocken and Derek Stock Scott and Stan Hawkins describe in their book on the subject, that these traditions um, must be preserved at all costs or that folk music is a universal language easily understood Instead, these people, they are focused on taking their audiences with them and reconnecting with their land, um, which is the British Isles, through music, song, dance and ritual, which is an important adage at the end there. So what is the folk, the New Wave Folk Movement? It's basically made up of practitioners who focus on decolonising their collections of traditional tunes and songs from the British Isles from within. So you know, peeling back the narratives of um, wealthier classes and educated classes about their music and developing this deep connection to place with their audience. And here um, on the side is a picture of Boss Morris who operate in Stroud, UK. And you can see they look quite different to those Morris costumes that um, we saw in the previous presentation. Um, I'm going to spend a bit more time on them soon. But um, first, I just want to provide um, a profile of three significant people. Um, the first is um, Sam Lee. Some of you may have heard of him. He's been operating for a while. But he's a performer of traditional ballads, and he's a self-described song collector. Um, he has a lot of albums, most recently Old Wow, and a couple of award-winning albums, The Fade in Time and A Ground of Its Own. He's also the creator of Singing with Nightingales, which is a site-specific performance work which he takes um, small audiences into the forest of Sussex, UK, and we'll get to hear a little bit of that soon. 
And then on top of that, he's also a BBC radio host. So he has that connection to kind of mainstream programming as well. And he um, also would call himself a folk activist. So you can see here, there's a picture of him jumping the fence at a, um, a Lord's estate, essentially. Um, he's part of what's called the Right to Rome movement. So he um, joins protesters going onto wealthy estates. They sing their songs, they make music. They do all kinds of things there as part of this protest against um, what they say is inaccessible land, like compared to Scotland, um, England has very small amounts of accessible land to the public and most of it is owned by the wealthiest people in their country. So he's a big part of that movement as well. So during COVID, um, he's been partnering with um, English Heritage, um, which is one of the uh, national kind of uh, it's like the National Trust, if you've heard of that. So English Heritage is another one of those who kind of operate a lot of historical sites around England. And he's been performing his songs um, on these sites. So here's one at Stonehenge. And um, I'm just going to play a little snippet of it, just so you can hear one of these. The, um, some of them are quite old ballads that he sings from the 17th century, 18th century. Um, and he sings them on site like this in, the, in quite a number of videos, if you were to go have a look on his YouTube. So here's just a small part of this one. Sweet England, sweet England, now awake unto the land obediently, and let us all partake. For our future now is calling, all in the sky so clear. So resound, resound, sweet England. England, for our history's always near. Let us um, it's beautiful and um, taking place on Stonehenge here, the, the New Wave folk movement, um, Stonehenge has become an important site for that. So we have um, lots of people gathering, say, on the summer solstice, the winter solstice at these sites. And a place like Stonehenge is important for these folk artists because it's, you know, it's a symbol of like a pre-industrial um, culture of England that has largely been lost. Like we don't know a lot about the Neolithic people. And so it's, it's got a sense of mystery. It's got a sense of deep connection to nature at a site where we know um, people found it to be a significant site. So people are exploring their kind of history of their relationship with the land at these kind of places. So. Another um, project that I mentioned that Sam has been doing um, is called Singing with Nightingales. And he took inspiration from this, um, this uh, cellist, Beatrice Harrison, who also um, would go into the forest and play with the nightingales. So he's done a BBC radio episode on it. And you can just hear a little bit here. <laughs> he used to sing in thirds with me. And it was such a joy, he used to twiddle about with the... Well, he was always in tune with the cello, you know. And it struck me how lovely it would be if he could be broadcast. It took some persuading, but Beatrice Harrison's wish was fulfilled when she played in her Surrey garden. A nightingale sang, and their duet, in one of the BBC's first outside broadcasts, was heard all over the land. That was exactly 90 years ago on the 19th of May, 1924. Through this episode here, you get to hear this cellist play. And then Sam's own um, performance, which is also called Singing with Nightingales. Um, he has this, it, it's actually a very small performance of a small audience of under 10 people. So it sells out every year and he runs it through um, the spring and the summer. And um, during COVID, again, they did one broadcast at home. So just to hear a little um, snippet of what he's been doing with this, I'm going to just... 
skip forward to, he has a bit of cello here. Oops, sorry. Yeah, we'll sing and we hear her, um, a bit later on him singing with the nightingale in the background here. Them small birds to hear I'll have you pay attention I'll listen draw near That when you've grown old this to say that we never heard so sweet that we never heard so sweet now this is becoming like an important um, experience for a lot of audiences in the UK to, to go and, and hear this music and he has quite a large following online and um, performs all around Europe as well with other kinds of performances around dinner tables and, you know, trying to generate that sense of community around their land and really trying to reframe that narrative of, of Englishness, you could say, that, that kind of has historically um, characterised the folk movement. Um, you know, like in my Morris dancing research, I remember reading some words by Cecil Sharp, who was a big name in the early folk revival, saying that an English person couldn't help but dance a folk dance because it was in their blood, you know. So kind of challenging what these nationalistic narratives were and reframing them in connection to their land um, in this kind of new folk practice. And another person um, um, who I just want to show as well is, is Ben Edge, and he's a visual artist and he's a documentary filmmaker. He's also a musician and composer of original music and songs about British folk traditions. Most recently, he has an album, New Tradition, and um, an upcoming album, The Children of Albion, which I'm going to be playing on that album a little bit as well. And uh, he got into um, this kind of music making because he started to film a lot of um, British kind of rituals that have been getting revived around the country. And he talks briefly on this video about what he kind of saw in that. And I just want to share what he says here because, um, and then we can hear one of his songs too. So. ...of uh, British folk culture, but also celebrations of universality and rituals. And the fact that everybody, all cultures practice this. And you could say it's what divides us, but actually for me, rituals and culture is what connects us because it's what, inspires curiosity between different parts of the world. We're living in, you know, troublesome times in a respect politically, you know, the political climate. We've got this fear of uh, climate change and we've got this collective fear of Brexit and what Britain will become, Brexit Britain. And for me, I don't know, I just want people to reconnect to this universal feeling of what it is to be human. It's very easy just to get pigeonholed that it's happening in Britain, but it, it's happening everywhere. It's a big part of human culture itself. So, you know, I think in some respects my work just began. The ethos behind what um, he, he uh, what's behind his music and his filmmaking, and here in this next video, um, it's one of his songs, and it's about a specific ritual that takes place in Scotland, in um, North North Queensferry, South Queensferry, South Queensferry, um, near the big bridge there over to the north of Scotland. And um, this festival takes place every year, and it's called the Buriman Festival. And he's written a song about it. He's been attending every year for a number of years. And we see a little snippet of the ritual here in his video, and then he sings with the, the headpiece on. So let's have a look here. Join your friends. 
That what he's singing there, hip hip hooray, it's the Burry Man's Day. That's what the bellman was saying as they walked through the street. Um, so he's taken that, that part and that's like the main chorus of his song in that example there. Um, yeah, so he's really interested in kind of representing these, these kind of traditions that are getting revived around the country um, in his music. And then finally, I'm just going to um, profile one other person here, Alex Merry. Oops, I don't want to play that just yet who's the founder of that Boss Morris um, folk dance group that I mentioned earlier. She's also a dancer, costume maker, visual artist. She's a former Vogue designer. And she uses design from historical folk, what, you know, somewhat pagan European traditions, and she's contemporizing them um, in folk dance. Um, she's using, in, in a lot of cases, like the dance steps um, recorded by Cecil Sharp, but she's kind of reinventing them with her, her group. And here's just a little bit of what they've been doing in their show reel here. I think are doing really interesting work and they have quite big followings all of these people um, and they really are changing a lot of the folk scene in the UK at the moment so what does it mean for music programming well the BBC has in some ways responded to this kind of change in how the folk scene is moving um, uh, they've been running a folk prom since 2018 it's because of COVID it's still fairly new this year it ran um, actually up in Newcastle where I've been working um, at the Sage Gateshead which is a um, a live music venue that predominantly does program folk music there. And if we just have a look at what their program actually was here, um, that's a picture of Sage Gateshead with the Northern Lights, which sometimes you can see in Newcastle. I didn't see them. But, um, here's what the program was. Let's have a look this year. And um, we've got John Adams, Judith Weir. We've got Spell Songs, which is a folk collection by um, some prominent kind of uh, folk artists like Jude, um, Julie Fowlis, who's a Scottish Gaelic singer, and, and some others. Um, and then it finished with Dvorak's uh, New World Symphony. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've got some people laughing in the audience here because we ended up having this. Um, the BBC wanted to connect with the university um, and, and get some people on a panel. And because there's so many folk artists working at the university, we ended up in this uh, Zoom conversation with a BBC producer where, you know, um, some of my colleagues really wanted to bring out like the cosmopolitan sort of project of spell songs in the panel. And essentially, uh, and you know, also like talking about really what Dvorak's music was a colonial project, you know, in the end of representation of what he thought African music was in, in North, in, sorry, North um, African American music. Um, so, yeah, like they weren't really interested in grappling with those things. So in fact, what they ended up responding was, oh, we just want someone with a Northern accent to be on the panel because we're not in London. <laughs> so, you know, so the BBC's focus on just getting out of London, oh, 
we're not really ready to come to terms with our colonial sort of history yet as a programmer or, or we're trying to but this is a bit too much for right now for a 20 minute panel you know that was kind of the feeling amongst me and my colleagues at the end of the meeting of like what it was that they actually wanted for this panel so it's just an interesting example of of how um you know how like the main what we could call the, the big national programmers and main stage um you know performance ensembles etc um are going to grapple with these issues and whether they can engage with them like what the kind of grassroots scene is doing and i'd say that it's slow going but hopefully like we can get there and hopefully there are lessons for us here in australia too so in terms of what um has been going on here in australia that is the um that that's the group of artists from the spell songs um part of the concert and you can see they've got people from all kinds of places that Britain has colonised. So that project actually is about trying to form those connections with these other nations that kind of have been oppressed by Britain and kind of reframe their relationship through folk music. So it is a really interesting project. Um, they say that, um, you know, it features the multifaceted talents and collaborative genius of Catherine Polwart, Julie Fowlis, Seku Keita, Chris Drever, Rachel Newton, Beth Porter and Jim Molyneux all renowned musicians in their own right and together their music blends a diverse array of sounds from instruments like the kora, electro harp, cello, Indian harmonium and more, which are gorgeously layered with musical and linguistic influences spanning from Orkney to Senegal. So you can see how they're trying to frame that. And yet that is programmed with the New World Symphony and, and not kind of wanting to be discussed in any kind of complex way, yeah. Um, so that's kind of, how that's worked out in the programming over there. I won't play that video there. That's just one of their spell songs videos. Um, but in terms of here in Australia, there are some people sort of grappling with like um, that connection to land um, in, in similar you know, ways. And a couple of people are um, Anthony Albrecht and Simone Slattery, who are people I've collaborated with a few times. And there's an exhib exhibition um, that they've worked on with Australian Geographic that's on right now in the um, Convention Centre at Darling Harbour. And um, then there's Joyce DiDonato here um, in her uh, opera performance too with Eden where she hands out seeds and all this kind of stuff. So, and then on top of what we've been looking at through the conference with like what Laura showed with your lovely like music um, just before. So there's other artists doing the same, but I'm interested to know who else is doing it because and how this can feed through. Particularly I'm interested in how it feeds through to that kind of main stage programming. Um, I have to finish, but um, just in one example of my own music as well, this is from one of my theatre shows that's just been touring a couple of weeks ago. Um, I played this on the harmonium. I, won't, I don't have time to play it, do I? But um, it's basically I've written it in Anglo-Saxon, which is older than Old English, because I wanted to sort of try and get beyond like all of like what those other folk artists are doing, get beyond all that kind of industrial age um, or you know modern age as much as possible with my own language I was inspired by Julie Fowlis because she sings in Gaelic I've got an Irish background but I don't speak Gaelic so this is kind of my own way of finding an older language and um, it's murder urza sustainer is you know it sounds very much like English but it's much older than that and it just means mother earth sustain us um, if I can finish, I'll just play a little bit of it. Um, and on Zoom, you'll just have to listen because I don't think you'll be able to see. Um, although I can't, oh, there it is. Um, yeah, so, oh. no. sorry if I can there. Um, I just can't actually, <laughs> I can't actually click it. There we go. Um, I'm just playing it on, a, instead of playing it live, because there's an actor who speaks in between the lines, just so you can hear, we developed it on a bundan on residency. So, you know, you kind of naturally connect with the land you're on when you do a bundan on residency on the south coast of Sydney, like south of Sydney here. So I'm also playing a harmonium here. This hill is old.
It existed long before words. It even existed before the stars. The spirit of this hill sat alone in a universe of darkness. Craving light, the spirit opened its mouth to sing the first song. No. The song brought forth the stars. Light blossomed and life emerged. Then came forth the children. Formed of song and craving it deeply, they were drawn to the hill to be closer to the source of all music. But they became greedy. The children discovered that the song's power could be harnessed, and so they desired to own it to bend it to their will. That's just an example of what I've been exploring in my own practice there. Um, so I'd love to chat now about, you know, what, what you think this could mean for music pro programming in Australia, whether that's main stage or sort of lower levels than that as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, and for someone who lived in the Northern England around the same time as you and was very interested in the new folk revival, revival was, yeah, it was, it was a fascinating presentation. Um, just, and to hear it all contextualised like that. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes for questions. If you want Zoomies, we're not, we see you. Okay, so you're, you're here too if you want to ask something. Um, all people in the room. Hello. Hello, Amanda. Amanda Harris. Thanks, Catherine, so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, and my question is not really about what you said you wanted to discuss at the end, but <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if someone else has a question that's more relevant to what you want to discuss. Um, did you, Miff? <laughs> um, so sorry about that. But um, I was just really interested. In, I mean, th this kind of new movement that you're describing is often obviously an effort to reach back to kind of pre-imperial mm. um, English practices and and the second performer you're pro profiling there's at Ben Edge yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Um, referred to Brexit and the kind of shifting yeah. you know I, I assume he's sort of thinking about increasing xenophobia or whatever and I was just wondering how you position um, this movement in comparison to other kinds of folk movements in England in that sense you know the sort of relationship with post-imperial Britain or, yeah, you know, yeah. a, a sort of immigrant Britain that's the direct result of all of that um, yeah. activity of empire over several centuries. Yeah, I mean, my feeling is that they're much more conscious of it and open about it than, say, like the folk players who I've been working with at, at Newcastle, who was that slight generation before us, you know, who are aware of it and conscious of it, but it doesn't really come out in their concert uh, format, whereas these people do just talk about it and they do invite people of all kind of nations, you know, to experience what they're doing. Um, and they like what Ben said in that video in his full documentary, like he addresses that as well. And um, I think these people really want to make overt that Britain, well, it's particularly now, it is not their own, like that people from Senegal have every right to be in Britain because they were colonised, you know, people from, um, you know, First Nations people from here have every right to go to England, you know, and because they were oppressed by, you know, so they're trying to, I think, form those, um, those kind of dual uh, two-way conversations, you know, to, to kind of grapple with their own history and kind of disentangle the narratives that have kind of 
been written by the victors to, to a lot of extent and not written by in other parts of Ben's documentary, he talks about how these rituals are essentially working class and, and um, are being led by working class people. They're not being led by the most wealthy people in their current society. And that's important to him as well. So I think um, in that respect, they really are wanting to invite kind of your everyday person to experience this stuff because it's not, in their minds, not as loaded with imperialism, imperialism as some of the other stuff might be from other folk performance, you know? Yeah. I'm going to go to Miss. Yeah, did you want to ask a question? Yes, you did. It was pretty much the same question as Amanda, <laughs> except perhaps hearing um, your response there um, of where the musicians are at and how they're sort of trying to. Um, I guess you'd say, you know, protect or not, you know, make a difference. Um, audiences, nevertheless, is there any um, sign, I suppose, that um, some people might be attracted to that element? One, you know, the sort of xenophobic um, audience. Um, and, and choose to be selective in their listening of what mm. musicians um, in terms of like xenophobia in the audience, is that yeah, what you were yeah, asking? Yeah, the, the people that might, uh, um, yeah, yeah, the people searching right, for some sort of um, nationalism, like yeah, seek to hear some things but not others. Yeah, well, I think um, there inevitably would be that. Um, however, I think these artists are trying as much as possible to take their audience on a journey with them. And so a lot of their music is overtly about these issues in a lot of ways, like Sam Lee would choose ballads that are historical ballads that deal with similar issues to what he thinks to be important now in England, um, for example. And um, like Boss Morris as a, like a contemporary Morris group, you know, they are challenging that kind of old white man Morris dancing kind of culture that's been around for quite a while now in England. Um, and you can see it's having an effect because, you know, the Daily Telegraph recent, uh, yeah, the Daily Telegraph it was, recently wrote an article about how, oh, Morris groups are under pressure to drop the 400 year old tradition of blackface, which by the way, it's not a 400 year old tradition of blackface in Morris dancing. So, you know, there is clearly like um, bringing up these issues like in the mainstream press and all kinds of places. So yeah, it is making, a difference for their audience in that way, because otherwise, why would these presses be mentioning it specifically? I think, yeah, so it's an interesting, they are very much trying to take their audience with them on this. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, thank you. That was very beautiful. Uh, I, I'm interested in the connection um, with the environmental movement. Uh, you talked about how a lot of the songs are a beautiful um, performance in the forest. And then in terms of what we think the power of programming is either in, in um, England or here to influence and, and what the connections are um, to be a bit more political with the environmental movement. Yeah, well, um, I think, you know, my friend Anthony, who I mentioned is, is operating here. Um, he's doing his PhD on exactly that, like how to communicate environmental issues in Australia in music concerts. Um, so that's kind of his area that he's just started a PhD on that. So I pro he probably could already answer that much better than me. <laughs> but um, uh, I mean, one thing he's been doing in his um, concerts is um, in where song began, like they feature all these projections of like Australian birds and they talk about Australian birds being um, some of the oldest and most intelligent birds um, in the world. And that's straight from a book called Where Song Began, which is um, which inspired their concert format. So they actually see um, some of their concerts as trying to bring their audience with them in that same kind of way. And I know in this Our Country exhibition that they've worked on with Australian Geographic, they've worked with an Indigenous singer who's been trying to- Gambira. Pardon? Gambira. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I know that um, that was really significant, the work they did there with um, how she like could demonstrate that connection to the land in that singing and 
with that footage because the exhibit is a lot of film um like it's many many hours of australian geographic archival footage and they've got this beautiful indigenous singing um, through a lot of the exhibition it's a 45 minute reel that runs um so that's just an example i, th I think of a pretty interesting approach but I'd, I'd love to hear if you know of any others and we've obviously heard yesterday at the round table of some really interesting um approaches to that as well so yeah i'd love to know if you know more um anyone else um just on that question of you know the xenophobic interest in, in folk music have you there's that podcast new albion by yeah. have you that this zakia i don't know her last name but it's very interesting podcast about that and they, uh, they asked that exact question like is the, is the national front morris dancing you know because there's concern and but yeah, yeah. their answer is no probably not yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, that's you know, right, yeah. but yeah it's certainly a, it's a live it's a live issue um i've had one really very quick question Catherine. um so you know the artists we saw and i know this in england they talk a lot about about the relationship with land you know and obviously in australia you know it's uh it's different yes and yes. i'd say more problematic in a way so the yeah. non-indigenous folk artists yeah, it's a very yeah. different relationship to land yeah um so i was just wondering if, you, if, if there's examples of australian folk artists who are i guess not indigenous but are thinking critically about their relation their their relation as a sort of you know as newcomers and yeah, how, how yeah. that might work yes well i asked that same question of some people who uh, sort of musicians, not folk musicians. So I don't actually know who who are. I mean, I had an interesting conversation with Mahesh yesterday, um, who just did a folk fellowship um, at the National Library, and he had some interesting things to say about that. Um, I'd love to talk to people like Laura about that. And, um, it's something I'm interested in exploring myself, you know, about my complicated relationship with this land. Um, I mentioned I've found all kinds of folk songs at my parents' house about kind of Irish people being brought here against their will. And I find that kind of interesting to explore for myself in my creative practice. Um, but yeah, I don't actually know who, who it is. And like you said, it's a very fraught kind of difficult terrain to navigate. Um, but I mean, I like Jackie Troy, who was here yesterday, um, I met her in 2017, I think, and she kind of invited me. We were creating that show Urza, which is obviously set in a fantasy world. Um, where I sing in that Anglo-Saxon and she kind of invited me to explore my own connection to land in Britain or wherever, you know, um, and that was a really um, generous invitation, um, which I took, you know, very seriously and something that I'm interested in continuing to explore personally, but I'd love to know if you know folk artists who are grappling with that here, because I think it's something that needs to be done now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's a provocation as well. Yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, thank Catherine. You. Um...